Welcome to nucleosynthesis. This is uh, mainly from the higher level parts. This is an HL uh, topic here. But you're welcome to listen in if you're an SL student, of course. Uh, so nucleosynthesis, what that really means, nucleo means nucleus, and synthesis means to make, uh, or at least that's one of the roots of it. So what we're talking about is how the elements are made. I love this one I hear us. I have a feeling this molecular cloud does not like you. <laughs> it's actually a real picture. It's not, this isn't photoshopped. Uh, I suppose you could say you Photoshop all of them because you do a bunch of layers, but I mean, it hasn't been altered. This actually does have this prominent feature like this. It's actually something called a Bach globule, and it's actually found in the Carina Nebula. So it looks like it's giving you the finger, doesn't it? So how do stars actually form? I mean, that might be a good question, right? Is how do they actually start going? Well, you need a whole bunch. Imagine you just did a bunch of hydrogen gas. And the way to make the hydrogen uh, in the universe, we have that kind of figured out from the universe. The Big Bang basically made hydrogen and a few other elements, but mostly hydrogen. Then imagine you have a big clump of gas of hydrogen. Well, if it's all attracted to itself and all the different atoms are all attracted to each other, then they might actually combine and collapse under their own gravity. And this is actually this, what we call genes criterion. That's why I put Chuck Norris because he's wearing some serious genes there. But this is called the genes criterion. Um, so this is just a cloud of hydrogen gas. It'll collapse under its own gravity as long as the mass of the gas cloud is bigger than this, what's called a genes mass. That's what MJ is, okay? That's the genes mass. That's it. So as long as you have bigger than this magic thing, that's it. Um, now, these uh, gas clouds, they can collapse under their own gravity like I just showed you with this genes mass. Or sometimes if there's other processes going on around them, that can also precipitate the collapse. For example, in the Orion Nebula, um, there's something called a proplid or a protoplanetary disk. Uh, what this is, is um, imagine you have some gas, and instead of it you know, collapsing under its own gravity because of genes mass, maybe you actually have some sort of stellar wind, so to speak. You have maybe like a, a really big, luminous star close to it it's actually pushing some of the gas and that gas then will get compressed and that might also initiate this so you can see some of these going on these are like little baby stars like oh how cute um i like this we've discovered a massive uh, dust and uh, gas cloud which is either the beginning of a new star or just an awful lot of dust and gas uh, so let's talk about the main sequence. We have already a few times. That's why I'm going to really gloss over this one quickly. Um, in the main sequence, if we're looking at this is luminosity, this is temperature. This is the main sequence. Remember what's going on? Hydrogen into helium. That's what stars are spending the vast majority of their lifetimes here doing this. They're converting hydrogen to helium in their core. Now, the star is in hydrostatic equilibrium. Remember, we talked about that as well. What that tells you that the outwards radiation pressure, the pressure from the light itself pushing outwards, is equal to and opposite to the inwards gravity force. Actually, I didn't draw my arrows the same size. I should have. But these are here are basically they're in opposition. And at the moment, when it's in the main sequence, everything's fine. They're happy. The push on both sides, so to speak, they're even. So that means it just stays the same size. It's called a stable main sequence star. So maybe we want to know what happens after the main sequence. This is maybe the slide that I have that has the most words on it. So we'll just talk about a few of the details here. So what happens after you run out of hydrogen? Um, it's really important. Just think about it like this. So think about what's going to happen. And you can usually reason your way through what's going to happen here. So imagine then first step, your core runs out of hydrogen because it used it all up well then you can't push outwards anymore so gravity wins so see so the gravity actually collapses it that's why the next step the core collapses and it might become dense enough to fuse helium this is actually called the helium flash so that's when helium can start making other things like carbon nitrogen oxygen can you see from this image right here so the sun for example hydrogen to helium when it runs out its core is going to collapse but what's weird is that the outer part actually expands so even though the core collapses the outer part expands so what's going to happen at some point it's going to get dense enough and hot enough to where bang helium can start fusing as well we call it the helium flash and it's going to go on and be pretty happy fusing helium to carbon and oxygen and other things uh, but of course and during that time by the way it's called a red giant but of course at some point it's going to run out of helium as well so that process is going to continue see that so it's going to collapse again and maybe gets dense enough and hot enough to fuse the next element and so on and so on and it's really going to depend on its mass 
not on its size, but its mass. So the more mass it has, the farther it can get because, you know, gravity can squish things more. If it's not very massive, at some point gravity can't squish much, so it sort of stops, becomes a white dwarf. Um, so basically it continues this process. It burns heavier and heavier elements. Uh, repeat, repeat, repeat. And this is basically what a star might look like, a really high mass star right near the end of its life. Can you notice that? So the outer part might still actually fuse. You might still have some hydrogen fusing to helium in the outer part. We call it a shell. It looks like an onion shell. So it's like, and then you have the next one, helium to carbon and oxygen. Then you got carbon to these ones and neon and oxygen and silicon. And you have iron is the limit. You can't fuse any higher. So iron, this element Fe, uh, was it 56, I think? It's 26 element. Um, iron is the highest you can fuse. So no matter what, no matter what kind of star you are, see these really high mass ones? They can go on and become these super giants. They're probably going to be the ones to get this. Our own sun won't get this far. It'll get a few elements in maybe, and then it'll kind of just stop and fizzle out and become a white dwarf. So this is sort of what happens now. So it, the interesting part happens with iron. So I think that's a maybe good thing to talk about. So remember, after the main sequence, depending on the mass, it can go up to iron. It can't fuse any heavier. It collapses, just like I said. So let's look at this graph of binding energy per nucleon. And this is from the core subjects here. Do you remember this graph, this binding energy per nucleon graph? It goes kind of like this. It's not exact. There's a few spikes here, but it's mostly like this. And the peak is iron. Whoops, I should actually do it right here. The peak is iron 56 here. That's the peak. And what we say is that a nuclear process, it'll happen on its own, sort of naturally, if you go up in this binding energy per nucleon. Remember binding energy, that's the energy um, that's released when you make a new element. So this binding energy per nucleon, if we divide it by the nucleon number, then we can sort of scale it properly. And it looks like this. So what we know is that as we go uh, do natural reactions, they will happen if you go up on this graph. So from a left here, from a, like a light element, let's say like, you know, hydrogen, for example, maybe uh, helium might be the next one. In order to go from hydrogen to helium, you know, you want to go up. That's why you fuse elements. That's why fusion is energetically favorable. What I mean by that is it, it goes up on this graph. Whereas if you're going to go up on this graph, you have to go left. You see that? Because if you went to the right, you go down on the graph. So that's why fission is energetically favorable here, because in order to go up on the graph, you have to go left, which means you got to go from heavier elements to lighter elements. And that's what fission is. Whereas here to go up, you got to go from lighter ones to heavier ones. That's why it's fusion. So, of course, what happens when you get to iron? Well, you can't fuse anything higher naturally, not on its own, not without some special cases. So because of that, then, um, it's kind of interesting because you might think, well, hold on. If you say that stars are making all the elements, we think they are, which is kind of amazing, isn't it? Just think about this in your own body. What are you made of? You've got lots of elements making you, right? Those elements, we think we're literally made in a star. You don't want to say like we think you're made of star stuff. We mean that literally. We mean that you actually, your elements were made in a star. You might think, well, how did I get from the star to not in the star? The next step, a supernova explosion. If a star has iron in its core, it's going to blow up. And when it blows up, it's going to scatter those guts, the carbon and the nitrogen and the oxygen that makes up you, for example. Um, that's going to be sent out and maybe some of those leftovers make a new star. Maybe that blows up and some of those leftovers made the earth and some of those leftovers were eaten by your mother uh, when she had you in her belly. And that's literally how you came to be, atomically speaking, which is kind of amazing. So when we say that, you know, we have this sort of hippy dippy sort of speech like, oh, you have it within you to do whatever. Well, in this case, if you wonder, like, what do you need to kill a star? Like in Star Wars, for example, they have these like, you know, crazy ways of killing stars by making these big devices that'll blow up planets or whatever else. Well, you can destroy a star. The stuff to destroy a star is literally in you because that's the iron that's in your blood. Your blood contains iron in it, right? That iron in your blood was very likely made in a star. And it's actually probably what made the star you were in blow up and send all that material to be out of the star. So we should thank iron. It's kind of amazing. It's, it's kind of like just mind blowing. Uh, 
So how do you make the elements heavier than iron, right? Because I mean, if you wonder, stars can by themselves through fusion, make all the elements up to and including iron. You might wonder, well, how the heck do we get things heavier than iron? Well, then we need extra help. It's not energetically favorable, so we need to do something else. There's a supernova explosion, and to make the heavier elements, we need extra energy and extra neutrons, it turns out. So there's different ways of doing neutron capture. There's R process and S process. R stands for rapid, S is slow. R process is uh, the element that doesn't have time to decay. In other words, you have an element, it captures a neutron and makes a heavier element. You need extra energy, so that's why you need it in the middle of the explosion. You make all these things. They're called seed nuclei uh, because they literally make the heavier ones. So usually you need a supernova explosion for the R processes. Now we've actually been able to make those on Earth because when we have a thermonuclear explosion, like a hydrogen bomb, for example, we have these processes happening. And it turns out to, through this different uh, through these different processes, we've actually been able to discover new elements. Uh, one's called Einsteinium, one's called Fermium. They are actually found using R processes or rapid processes. Conversely, there's something called slow process. That's where the element does have time to decay. So imagine you have a heavier element, it decays to a lighter one, and that you know is part of this slow process. So you can make these new elements, but they don't make heavier ones really. I mean, they, well, they need heavier ones to make more heavy ones. So these aren't the ones that are going to make all the elements you need. You actually need R processes first, but then rapid uh, slow processes, sorry, they can come in afterwards and help out as well. Uh, so finally, uh, we can talk about this, the final stages of a star's life. Final stage, it all depends on the final mass. Okay, so when I say that, I mean the remnant mass. I mean the mass of it, when it's done all these processes, what's left? What's its mass? Because remember, it's giving up mass every second of its life. We talked about this before, but its mass, if it's less than this chandra Sekar limit, remember, that's the maximum uh, mass of a stable white dwarf star. So in order to be a stable white dwarf star, it has to have a remnant mass less than 1.4 times the mass of the sun. Anything less than that, like our sun will be, you're going to be a white dwarf. That's because what happens is, I like this, you literally can't even right now. Uh, this is from Saturday Night Live. <laughs> but um, so this is just the star itself, it can't push out anymore. Remember, it's always about this, this constant battle between gravity and radiation pressure. Somebody just gives up, says, I can't make any new elements. I don't have enough gravity. I can't even right now. So it just gives up. Uh, but you have this little step that these, new, these electrons can't be squished anymore. So it's called electron degeneracy pressure. It stops this. So it just becomes a stable thing. The electrons can't be squished anymore. Our sun is now, you know, if we did a comparison, it's this size. As a white dwarf, it'll be a lot smaller. That's the result. But if the remnant is between 1.5 and 3 solar masses, that's called the Oppenheimer-Volkov limit, um, it's enough to break through the electron degeneracy. And what it does then, it makes a neutron star. So this is called neutron degeneracy. Now, when it makes a neutron star, again, it can't even right now. It can't push back. So this is the kind of, this is the really cool part. Watch this. So in this star at the core, what happens is this. The core can't push out, right? It can't even. So what happens is it can't push out. So gravity comes in and gravity wins. It crushes through electron degeneracy pressure and it ends up making a solid neutron core. When it makes that, the core is literally solid, right? It can't be squished anymore. So what happens then is this incoming mass, all of it coming in at really close to the speed of light, it bounces off this core. So when we say it's a supernova explosion, it's actually an implosion, right? That bounces off a solid neutron core. So imagine all this material bounces off the solid core, sort of boing, 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 and that flies out. And that is actually where all this supernova explosion, all this material gets scattered out. And the resulting is going to be a neutron star. This isn't a real picture, it's just a diagram. It turns out neutron stars will all be also called pulsars because uh, they have so much energy as they spin around, depending on the direction. They're going to have these big uh, jets of high energy basically going around. And again, remember, this is our processes. Those are making the heavier elements. This is a really cool story. Um, turns out the Chinese, they were really good at mapping out where things were in the sky. And in 1054, they had actually said, oh, there was something really bright in the sky. They even said where it was. So we know the age of it. We know it's in 1054, something really exciting happened. And later on, as astronomers were like, hey, wait a second, that sounds an awful lot like what a supernova explosion that's relatively close by might look like. So we looked uh, with our telescopes, and it turns out right where they said it would be, there's now, it's called the Crab Nebula. 
So we know what a supernova explosion looks like almost a thousand years later. So this is the re result, right? So this is the resulting hot gas that expanded. And in the center, this is again an example of science being awesome. The theory says this should happen. You should have a neutron star, which should be a pulsar, and it should, because of conservation of momentum, angular momentum, you know, imagine like a figure skater, you know, start to spin with their arms out, then they sort of put their arms in. It should spin really fast, right? So they actually predicted this thing right here should spin pretty fast, like a few times per second. Well, it turns out right in the center, and I can show you in a zoomed in version. So this, you know, see right around here? Now we're zooming in here. Do you see this weird blue arc? That's actually happening from some really crazy um, energetic particles being you know, thrown out. But right around here, right where the tip of the arrow is, that's where they've actually found a neutron star, right where it should have been. And so that means it's a pulsar. And they actually caught its signal. It happens to be lined up where it actually, we're really lucky for that. And it rotates about 30 times a second. So it's like, it's really, really, really fast. That's how fast this thing spins. Isn't that an awesome example of science being right? Now, what happens if the remnant mass is bigger than three solar masses? We're not sure, but you get a black hole. You probably kind of break space, or at least space certainly warps in on itself and curves around. And there's a whole um, optional topic called relativity where we go into a little bit more detail about that, about the event horizon, or this so-called uh, Schwarzschild radius. So you have enough mass to basically break through. You basically crush neutron degeneracy. It makes a black hole. This is a picture actually from uh, the movie Interstellar. And basically what's really cool about it is they do really weird things. Because it's a black hole, I mean, not everything gets sucked into it. Things can actually have stable orbits around black holes. As long as you don't go too close, as long as you don't go within the event horizon, then you're never getting out. You can't even send for help because you can say, help. Oh, even your light signal would curve back in because even light can't escape. In terms of that, actually, that's how we define it. But it turns out uh, there's time difference from it. And if you've seen the movie uh, Interstellar, uh, there's a time difference. The closer you are to a black hole, the diff more differently uh, time will tick for you compared to someone away. And so they sort of play with this idea. They go to this planet uh, that's orbiting this uh, black hole called Gargantua, I think it was. And, you know, like one hour on the planet, I think it was like, you know, a year somewhere else or something like that. It was a huge time difference. Uh, it doesn't happen quite that extreme, but it really does happen. So we actually have examples in the relativity option of that. But just to go to show you that this is real stuff, it really does happen, but we're talking about the remnant. So the original star, it can be like, you know, 20 times the mass of the sun or something like that, right? I just mean the remnant. If the resulting, after it's done all its process, then it's this. It's always the remnant mass. That's important, okay? The remnant mass is this. They start off way heavier. Remember, they burn off mass every second of their lives. So when they're done, if they're roughly this, they'll do this. Is that kind of mind-blowing?